Hey everyone, this is YML and in today's video I would like to talk a little bit about a mathematical concept that I found quite daunting when I first encountered. But once I understood what it tried to tell me, it has become one of the most beautiful and fundamental things about mathematics that I've ever personal ever discovered in my learning journey. Well, you most likely guessed by now what I am talking about. The subject of today's video is nothing else than the Fourier transform. So let me start with the beginning. If you were like me and work with signal processing systems, you have certainly encountered the Fourier transform by now and probably already know that it's used to extract the corresponding frequencies from any input signal. However, at least in my case, although I had this vague definition of what it does, it was really really hard for me to understand the connection to this mathematical definition. I mean, how exactly does this E relate to a signal? Why is it raised to the power of i? Or why do we have an integral from minus infinity to plus infinity here? And the questions kept going without a clear answer for, shamefully, quite a bit of time. Until one week when I just sat down and decided once for all to make that connection. Thus, in this video, I would like to walk you through the ideas necessary to understand the mathematical formulation of the Fourier transform. And hopefully, by the end of this video, the reasons behind why this equation represents the signal decomposed into its frequencies will make much more sense. To do that, I would like to make sure that we all are on the same page and understand what a complex number is and how it can be represented. So, the complex numbers came from the necessity of finding the square root of negative numbers because until then, no one knew how to do that. René Descartes was the first one to coin the imaginary number i, which is equal to the square root of minus 1, and also came with a definition for a complex number as a plus bi. What's interesting about these numbers is that they can be plotted into the 2D plane if we consider the y-axis to be the imaginary axis and the x-axis to be the real number axis. However, René Descartes regarded the complex numbers as fictitious or useless, and it was not until Euler that they became more popular. What Euler was interested in was to find the limit as n approaches infinity of the following equation. And after some calculations, he found out that this was equal to 2.718281 and so on, or the number e, which was named after him. What is interesting about this equation is that if we switch the numerator of the second term to some constant, then the limit of this equation becomes e to the power of that number. And because Euler was certainly an extremely curious mind, he put as constant the number ip. And what he found out has become one of the most, if not the most beautiful and elegant equations in the whole mathematics. He found out that as n approaches infinity, the following equation is equal to minus 1. Or in other words, we obtain that e to the power ip is equal to minus 1. And if we rearrange things, we obtain an equation which is also known as the Euler identity. But why stop here? Euler certainly didn't. So he tried out different imaginary numbers, and what he found out was that every time, those numbers would end up on the unit circle. Even more, the angle this vector creates with the x-axis in radians is equal to the number you are multiplying i to. And if you know a little bit of trigonometry, you will know that the value on the x-axis would be equal to the cosine of that angle, and the number on the y-axis would be equal to the sine of that angle. So, in other terms, e raised to i phi, the angle in radians, is equal to cosine of phi plus i sine of phi, which is known as the Euler formula. I don't know about you, but when I first found out these things, they simply blew my mind because concepts that seemed so alien to each other ended up in being really, really connected by an equation as simple as this one. Alright, that's all nice and beautiful, but maybe now we are wondering how is this connected to the Fourier transform. Well, 
That will be the focus of the next part in this video, where we will connect this equation, the Euler formula, to frequencies. So, what is a frequency more exactly? A frequency can be loosely defined as the number of cycles or repetitions per unit of time. This means that we can measure the frequency of almost any event that has a repetition in time. The number of times a pendulum oscillates in a second, the number of times a satellite orbits the Earth, or the number of cycles per second that a signal completes. Well, all these events that repeat in time can be nicely abstracted by the Euler formula. How? By taking advantage of the properties of the unit circle. Let me explain. So, again, the following point on the unit circle can be expressed using the Euler formula as follows. But if we increase slowly the angle made by the point with the positive x-axis and keep doing so, we arrive after a while in the same spot. More exactly, we arrive in the exact same spot after we increase the angle by exactly 2 pi radians or 360 degrees. And if we keep increasing the angle phi, then the same pattern arises. So, in a nutshell, what I'm trying to say is that the Euler formula also has a periodicity that can quite nicely capture periodic events by thinking in terms of how many times does my complex number go around the unit circle as the frequency of that event. More specifically, in signal processing, we can create a duality between how many times our complex number goes around the unit circle and how many times our signal repeats in a unit of time. What's even more interesting is that by using this equation, we can easily capture the intensity of a periodic event by varying the radius of the circle. If we have a larger radius, we increase the signal intensity or the amplitude and if we have a smaller radius, then we decrease its intensity. Also, by using the unit circle analogy, we can represent how delayed is the signal or its phase by moving the starting point around the unit circle. Ok, and now that we have gone through all of this, let's try again to explain what the Fourier transform tries to tell us. Actually, what we have here is the inverse Fourier transform and I will use it since, at least from my point of view, it's easier to understand. Alright, so here we have the e to the power i 2 pi k, meaning that we are interested in a signal with a frequency k without any amplitude or phase, which is mathematically representing as how many times we go around the unit circle and we take this complex number representing the signal of frequency k and do what? We multiply it with the result of the Fourier transform, which is yet another complex number that has an amplitude and phase. Thus, when we multiply those two, what we actually do is amplifying and shifting our periodic signal by the amount specified in the first complex number. Then, we do the same thing for all frequencies from minus infinity to plus infinity, and if we integrate them, we obtain our original signal. And thus, my fellow viewers, is what the Fourier transform is trying to tell us in its mathematical form. Now, you may be wondering, why do we go through all this fuss of using imaginary numbers? Well, simply put, because it's elegant and easy to work with. Actually, it turns out that you can write the Fourier transform without using any complex numbers and, as far as I understood, that's how Fourier initially wrote it down. However, it was quite cumbersome to work with because it required two separate transformations to reconstruct the signal. And, as Albert Einstein once said, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. Ok, ok, but why not simpler? Why can't we write the Fourier transform using only the cosine? Well, you can capture the magnitude of a frequency component by using only the cosine, but unfortunately, you can't capture the phase, which is as important as the magnitude. The phase tells us how shifted our signal is, but now the question is, how shifted from what exactly? Because you need a reference system in order to say that. Well, by using the complex representation, we can measure the phase as the difference between the real part cosine 
and the imaginary part I sine. And that's basically the meaning behind the Fourier transform equation. I hope you found this explanation helpful. Please hit the thumbs up button if you did. Share your thoughts in the comments below and subscribe to be up to date with the new content. See you next time. Bye bye.